putting it down. As the people who are out there taking care of the trees in our communities, I salute you and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I hope that as you conclude your conference this week, you'll go out there renewed, reconnected, recommitted to your jobs, and with new relationships and friendships between all of you that will help you do the work that you need to do. I know a lot of you probably don't get paid what you're worth. I know a lot of you put in extra time to take care of the things that you know need to be taken care of, and I thank you for that. You know, every state has a different um, set of regulations and laws with regard to trees. And I think it's interesting that in, in Seattle, we're beginning to understand that perhaps our tree regulations are actually not protective enough. And our, and our guardianship of the tree canopy needs work because we are changing in ways that our regulations do not now accommodate. I think it's also interesting to look at states such as Massachusetts, where I did the work on this book, where, of course, their history as communities, as towns, as developed spaces, are far older than out here in the Pacific Northwest. They approach trees differently in Massachusetts. There is a state law in Massachusetts in which every town, and there are hundreds of them in Massachusetts, has a tree warden. I love that, don't you? It sounds like the Lorax, right? I've got my badge. I'm the tree warden. <laughs> This person has a very important job. Sometimes it's in addition to whatever they do as the public works director or what have you, but sometimes it's someone whose whole job is to take care of the trees in the public realm. Maybe they're in the town square, maybe they're along the road, but their job is to educate the public about trees and tree health and also look after the tree health of the trees in the public space. And if there's a need to take one of those trees down or a discussion about it, there's a public hearing and you know what? The tree itself is posted, right? <laughs> Not only that, the hearing is held at the tree, which is pretty innovative, pretty interesting. The idea of connecting people physically, directly, with the trees that we're talking about. You want to take it down? Let's talk about why. We don't have a shade tree ordinance in the state of Washington. It's something that perhaps all of you should be thinking about. Is that something we ought to have in the state of Washington, in the state of Oregon, in Idaho? As we continue to develop, do we need it in BC? You know, this, um, this is something to think about. Look for the examples of the communities that have been developing more fiercely, faster, and longer than we have. Are there things that we can learn from our neighbors around the country? So with that uh, bit of introduction, I want to tell you that um, I myself grew up in a kingdom of trees. I was very fortunate for that. I was raised in Westchester County. Uh, New York, on a place with seven acres of woods, just native mixed woods, you know, maples, oaks, glorious white cedars, um, beautiful trees, and uh, every day my mother would say the same thing, go outside and find something to do. <laughs> and I've never really changed from um, the skinny, scrappy kid of those years covered with bruises and calamine lotion and surviving uh, everything from swinging on grapevines and building fires and who knows what else and you know that kind of wonderful unmanaged childhood outside outdoors that too few kids get these days and yes climbing trees and loving trees from uh, earliest age they have been dear to my heart and formative to my imagination so I guess it's not too surprising that Trees have been a big part of my professional work as the environment reporter at the Seattle Times. And I have written, by now, five books, but one of them actually was all about one tree, a single 100-year-old oak tree, which I encountered at the Harvard Forest. Because you're tree people, perhaps some of you have actually been to the Harvard Forest as a research forest in Petersham, Massachusetts, which is about an hour and a half west of the main campus of Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Founded in 1907, it's 4,000 acres of native New England woods. Um, this is a picture of Shaler Hall, which is the main administrative hall at the Harvard Forest. And people who are at the Harvard Forest like to say, there's just enough Harvard at the Harvard Forest. The red brick thing, right? The little Georgian um, architecture. But the scientists, and there's and there some 40 people who work at the Harvard Forest full time, including about a dozen um, senior scientists love the fact, by the way, that they are an hour and a half west of Cambridge and that they're out in 4,000 acres of woods where scientists, not only who are on staff, but from around the world, come to study everything from tree health 
insects um, to soils and atmosphere exchange, you name it, if it's about trees and our planet, they're interested in it. And people do come from all over the world, in addition to fellows, research fellows, who are invited to come and pursue a project for as long as a year. I was fortunate enough to be one of those fellows in 2014-15, uh, where I wrote the manuscript for this book, and where I got to live that whole year with a single 100-year-old oak tree. And I was pursuing an important question, which is what can trees tell us about climate change? And that's what I want to talk about with you this morning. So, as I mentioned, this is the Harvard Forest, and it's a classic New England wood, beautiful in the ways that um, have been so celebrated always, these big, beautiful sugar maples, um, many, many, many big old trees. You know, the classic, gorgeous New England fall that's about to begin unfolding in about two weeks. It should be peak color time, and they're expecting a spectacular year this year in New England. Um, I got to live in this house, this beautiful white farmhouse. It was a many times made over old farmhouse that was the original uh, farmstead of the family that had the land before Harvard bought it in 1907, specifically for a research forest. Um, it's an interesting place, you know, it, it, the Harvard Forest actually ripped out their oil furnace about five years ago, just carted away, scrapped it, and decided to convert to heating the entire physical plant of the Harvard Forest with wood taken immediately from the forest by the woods crew. This is some of the firewood. Like me, you probably appreciate the honor of a big wood pile that looks that good, right? You know what it takes to split, stack, season, and burn quality firewood. There's no cut corner that will give you those BTUs in December. You've got to start planning way in advance and do the work yourself. And I uh, was rather astonished at the scope of the wood gathering, cutting, stacking, and burning effort at the Harvard Forest. And they did that. Um, for several reasons. One was to try to get away from fossil fuel use and convert to bioenergy. But the other, interestingly, was to, to continue to grow what they call a local wood shed. Similar to the idea of a food shed, the concept is that you source the wood that you use locally. And it's, a, I think, a very smart thing that we here in the Pacific Northwest should pay a lot more attention to celebrate and grow. I noticed you had a speaker here earlier this week who talked about milling furniture and creating products from urban trees. That's a good idea. But I want, I want to go further with that and encourage you and your work <clears throat> and all of us to think about sustaining, growing, and producing a local woodshed. We have excellent forest practices laws in the state of Washington. We worked hard to create those. They're very protective. They're some of the best anywhere, and they take into consideration everything from water quality to fish health. We should be harvesting as much as our wood as we possibly can from our local forests to create jobs, to protect forests against excessive fire, fire that's happening because we haven't been doing the forestry that we should be doing, and also to connect people to the forests that we depend on don't, you know, source your wood remotely from somewhere else with no thought as to what the forestry regimes may be in those places. If you use it, grow it here. Know what the rules and regulations are. If you don't think they're strict enough, advocate for that. If you think that in some way, you know, we are disconnected from the products that we use, we all in this room know that is wrong. We're absolutely intimately connected to these forests, and I believe that we need to think about that and use and promote local woodshed practices. That's what this big wood pile was about at the forest. They were really trying to source locally the wood that was needed to heat the place, and I liked that. I also love wood heat. The Harvard Forest is in a remote, tiny little town in New England, tiny little place called Petersham, Massachusetts. The place looks like a Courier and Ives Christmas card. But the forest itself was an incredibly international experience. Because researchers came from all over the globe to work there, they also brought their families, and it made for those of us who were living there as fellows 
for a very rich experience. This was my friend Isra. She was the wife of one of the uh, other fellows at the forest, and I was teaching her how to bake an apple pie. She got it on the first try, as you can see. Uh, this um, man wearing the cap and gown was her husband, and with him is one of the uh, senior ecologists at the forest who helped him get his work done in order to get his PhD. It was a very beautiful thing to see people come from all over the world to finish their education, write their scientific papers, and uh, go on in their careers in their home countries. So the Harvard Forest was in many ways a kind of catchment for um, tree people from all over the world. It's also a place where, because it was in a rather remote location, and a lot of us were from all over, we took care of one another and formed our own community. Here we are creating a big Thanksgiving feast that we cooked ourselves and ate in the middle of the day, just because so many of us were waifs and strays from all over. There's something nice about a small town, something nice about these kind of intense communities that we create when we're thrown together for a project, whether it's to learn something, build something, or do something. Um, but for me, the big draw at the Harvard Forest was the science itself, the opportunity to work with uh, scientists at the forest to begin to build and expand my knowledge of trees and how they work and how we can see through trees the effects of climate change right here on the landscapes in which we live that this is not some distant force far in the future that's not going to affect us. As you know, as tree people, it's right here, it's right now. But what were the details of that? How could you really see it? What did trees do that we could examine to understand how climate change is affecting forests, forest ecology, and our human communities right here and now? So going out with people like Neil Peterson, an expert dendrologist into the field, and coring trees together with him and David Orwig in the black shirt here, who's a master uh, dendrologist as well at the forest, um, going out to do tree survey work with people like Audrey, um, and, and just really getting a sense of how on the landscape you can read the history of a forest, understand what has happened there over deep time, not just a decade, not just 50 years, but 100, 150. That was a real privilege for me, and, and it's what the immersion experience of being at the Harvard Forest as a fellow for an entire year, what that could bring to me as a writer. I think for them, it was a little bit odd living with a newspaper reporter. I, I don't think they were really used to having a member of the media right in their midst, embedded with them each and every day. But I think uh, the novelty of it was also kind of fun. And, uh, you know, it wasn't long before I figured out that there while this was a native New England wood, it was very heavily wired, very, very different from any forest that you would walk along anywhere else, because sooner or later you'd run into something like this, a 200-foot high tower right in the middle of the woods, very heavily instrumented to, um, to everything, from measure the forest atmosphere exchange, to even with these cameras that you see at the top of the tower, observe the tree canopy. Those are actually bank security cameras, and they're not looking for robbers, of course. They're looking for leaves and to monitor the changes in the tree canopy over the course of the seasonal year. And that turned out to be very key to my story. This is Andrew Richardson coring that tree. And Andrew was a professor at the Harvard University and doing a lot of work at the Harvard Forest. And I hooked up with Andrew while I was a research fellow at MIT in science journalism the year before I went to the forest. You know, I went to MIT to start to dig into this whole question of climate change and trees. And I discovered that Andrew was doing work with phenology, that is, the regularly occurring seasonal changes in nature and the tree canopy, and how if you observed the tree canopy through the seasonal year and did it over time, you could actually see the fingerprints of climate change. So I, I hooked up with Andrew, I began working with the researchers in his lab and following his research at the Harvard Forest. So uh, winter time was a good chance to actually start to really get into the documentary side of this story. Uh, I happened to be there during the record cold winter of 2014, which is really saying something in Massachusetts. This is looking out of that beautiful sun porch you saw in the back of the house. Well, this is what it looked like in, say, January. 
It was fiercely, bitterly cold, tons of snow. As someone from the Pacific Northwest, I actually loved that because for me it was a lot of fun. We don't get a lot of snow here. <laughs> you know, it, it, it really was quite a lot of fun. Um, and it was a chance to utilize the Harvard Forest uh, resources that were available to me. They have a fantastic archive there of tree stand records that go back 100 years. This is the handwritten uh, diary of the Sanderson Farm, which was the landscape on which the Harvard Forest was founded. Typical of the kind of beautiful records that were available to me in the archives. And I spent a lot of time digging into the landscape history of the forest during the winter when actually the field science, of course, was rather shut down. Um, but it became clear to me very soon, once I got to the forest, that the work of John O'Keefe, pictured here with me, wearing my full bug uniform. <laughs> Let's take a moment and be grateful for the forests of the Pacific Northwest. No um, ticks. These things are the, are the lions of the Serengeti. I mean, they're absolutely, completely dangerous. I think they're the most dangerous wildlife in North America. And they've got ticks, and they've got black flies, and they've got mosquitoes. And you know what? They all want exactly the same thing, your blood. <laughs> so working in the Harvard Forest, it was a full body experience with, you know, the, the gear from head to toe trying to protect myself from all these things that wanted to suck my blood. But um, John O'Keefe was doing really important work at the forest that I quickly realized I was going to need to get very close to. Uh, John took it upon himself to begin a phenology trail at the Harvard Forest. And in this trail, he isolated the same 50 trees, different species, different forest heights that he followed in a regular weekly walk in spring and in fall for 25 years. That's quite a commitment to observation and to on the ground detail. Remember the tower that I showed you earlier in the slideshow? Andrew had cameras up in that tower observing the tree canopy from a height of about 200 feet. Those cameras were taking images com continuously and logging them at a server at um, the University of New Hampshire. But Andrew teamed up with John, who was doing this regular week, week, week walk during the fall, during the spring. And between the two, you had the best of both worlds. You had an on the ground, ground truth, if you will, of the seasonal changes in the forest combined with the big picture, that imagery of the tree canopy. And you put that together with all the other usual uh, measurements from instruments, atmosphere exchange, growth rate, um, moisture use, etc. And you can really begin to get a picture of what the forest, under the hood of that incredibly complex machinery of the forest, was doing year by year, season by season. This is John heading back to Shaler Hall after one of his weekly walks. Um, you see in his hand there just how complicated the instrumentation is that he's using. We're talking old school here. Clipboard, paper, pencil, binoculars. Um, he measured very little. Sometimes he would check the length of a bud as it was growing. Mostly what he did was look at things very closely. Um, I love this high tide of ferns that begins to come up in the uh, forest in the spring. And there he is with his binoculars. What he's looking for is the, is the leaf out and the bud burst in the forest in the spring to chronicle it week by week. And, you know, very quickly I thought to myself, this kind of observation that John is doing, this phenological observation, is perfect because it gives me a way to see the forest up close and personally with an expert. And I also decided early on I needed a tree of my own. And so I wrote to him one night, sent him an email, said, John, I need a tree. <laughs> because I needed a character, a focus from my story of how climate change is affecting forests. And so we went out to audition trees on his route. We walked the route and we checked over different trees and thought about them. There was a striped maple that I really loved because of that, that's such a beautiful species. I guess a very soft yellow leaf in the fall, unlike any other. It has this cool photosynthesizing bark that is striped with the green of its photosynthetic areas. But it wasn't big enough, it wasn't old enough, it didn't have any gravitas, so no, no striped maple. We walked on further, and there was a beautiful uh, black gum tree, actually the oldest tree in the Harvard Forest, it's about 350 years old, 
But that species for me was a little too exotic. People wouldn't know it. They didn't necessarily know about black gum, also called tupelo. And I thought, eh, I don't know. I want a tree that people know, a tree that people love, a tree that they would have some connection to. And finally, John walks up to this tree, a big old oak tree, about 100 years old. He puts his hand on it. He says, you know, this one, I think this might be the one for you. And I thought to myself as I tip my head back to see it growing tall, straight, beautiful in the forest, I thought, that's perfect. Because in the northern hemisphere, oak is the most common species, right? If it were an animal, it would be a dog. Everyone has an oak tree that they know or they love. And there's a deep cultural continual connection between people and oak trees, whether you're talking about the Royal Navy and the oaks that they use to create their hearts of oak ships, or the oak trees used in construction all over uh, the United States, or just their enduring beauty. This is a tree that people know and love. And so we decided that that tree, with its scientific tag, B-T-Q-U-R-U-O-3, would be the tree for my story, my witness tree. It just remained uh, to do one more thing, which was to confirm its age, which is what um, Dave Orwig is doing in this picture. He's coring into the tree. I knew I needed a tree about 100 years old. I wanted a tree that had sprouted during the time that our climate love affair, our climate changing love affair with fossil fuels was just really beginning to kick in. So 1905, that's about when bottle teas start coming off the assembly line. It's when agriculture begins to go into a completely different kind of methodology, no longer horses and manure, but more petrochemicals, more machines, bigger scale. Our whole relationship with nature, in fact, begins changing around that time. For the first time in human history, more people begin to live in cities than in rural areas. A disconnection is starting to take root. So a tree that's that old is the perfect age for my story. We cored it and um, confirmed under the microscope reading the core here that indeed my tree sprouted as a wild sprout about 100 years ago. And importantly, it sprouted by a stone wall. That was meaningful. The Harbridge Forest is laced with stone walls. You walk through the ghosts of a former time, an agricultural time, when people in New England worked small farms all over this landscape. They walked away from those farms beginning in about 1860 because of the changes that were coming to other landscapes nearby. The opening of the Erie Canal suddenly provided market access to the larger farms of the Midwest and those deeper soils. And so New England farmers began literally walking away from those little hill farms that they'd been working for 100 years that they had cleared from forests. We like to think of Thoreau as pen with a pencil, you know, out there in some beautiful remote wooded place. Not true. He wrote at the height of deforestation in New England. He would say in his journals, thank God they can't cut down the clouds. People started walking away from those farms at about the time that he was writing because they just couldn't compete with the agriculture that was coming and suddenly had access to the populous New England markets. And so as they walked away, what do you think happened next? Exactly, the forests began coming back. And so my tree also documented this shift of people leaving these agricultural landscapes, leaving these agricultural lifestyles to do what? Go work in the factories that were beginning to change our world even then. If you look at the increase in carbon in our atmosphere, CO2, you can trace it very directly to the industrialization of our economy. The amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has always fluctuated over Earth's history. We live on a very adventuresome planet that at times has been entirely encased in ice, at other times has been far warmer with even tropical climates all the way up to the poles. But the difference in what is happening now on Earth is the rate of change. I'm talking about an increase in atmospheric CO2 since the Industrial Revolution that is without precedent on our planet in terms of the rate of increase of CO2. What that means is that the living world, the trees, the animals, are having to adapt at a rate that is far quicker than they are set up to do. 
Trees are not fruit flies. They do not go through a generation in just a couple of days. They need time to adapt to these changes. And we are seeing some of these changes, and trees are geniuses of adaptation. But if you look at a tree like my oak, that's been there for 100 years, you can see how this massive increase in CO2 is affecting its physiology and also the ecological function of the forest. So here it is, my beautiful tree. I watched it through four seasons, spring, high summer, fall, and the spare beauty of winter. And I want to tell you a little bit about what walking that forest with John there every single week in spring and in fall was like, and also what he was learning. I'm going to read to you a little bit from the book. John O'Keefe's records show how climate change is altering the seasonal timing of the forest. Leaf out is coming earlier, with an advance of spring by nearly five days on average since O'Keefe started making observations more than 25 years ago. The onset of the first frost in the fall had changed even more. O'Keefe used to observe hard frost as early as the first weeks of September. But by the time we began our collaboration in 2013, the first frosts often weren't coming until late October. On average, spring is coming earlier, fall is coming later, and winter is being squeezed on both ends. Everything in the woods reflected these changes, from the level of water in the vernal pools and springs, to when the black flies were biting, the ground frozen, or leaves budding out, or finally coming off the trees. It wasn't a matter of conjecture, conjecture or political argument. The discussions of who does or doesn't believe in climate change in editorial pages, news reports, and congressional debates frames this all wrong. Climate change, the trees, streams, and puddles, and birds, bugs, and frogs attest, is not a matter of opinion or belief. It is an observable fact. Leaves don't lie. Thank you. Frost isn't running for office. Frogs don't fundraise. Pollinators don't put out press releases. What O'Keefe had compiled while taking all those walks was the testimony of an unimpeachable witness, the natural world, including the big oak, my witness tree. O'Keefe's survey walks were a way to observe the planetary dynamic of climate change on an intimate scale and see its effects tree by tree. I think for myself, and probably a lot of you, this was an incredibly refreshing reset of perspective. You know, here we are listening to someone like Scott Pruitt, the head of EPA, saying he doesn't believe in climate change. And we say to ourselves, really, have you looked around? I mean, as tree people, people who work with the living world, and probably who have done it year in and year out, and I, by the way, thank our speaker this morning for his 90 years on Earth and 38 years of service with the ISA. What a beautiful thing. What a thing to be proud of indeed. Um, you know, you know this. You, you live with trees, you work with trees. Um, we know that this is not a debate, and we know that it's not something to wonder about. It's a fact. And so, um, you know, the, the thing about phenology is that this grounding in the seasons and the rhythm of the natural world is more than... Um, just taking a walk, isn't it? It's looking very closely at the seasonal emergence around you, day by day, uh, even hour by hour, you can see changes if you know what to look for. It is also a beautiful stance in life to take the time to really look closely at the beauty of the living world. And we looked at everything from the native wildflowers and when they began to come up in that fantastic ephemeral time when the temperatures have warmed, the leaves aren't yet out, and you've got that six-week window when there'll never be as much sun on the forest floor as there is white right then. And you know what happens, don't you? Everything springs to life. And we also, of course, um, observed the first coming of fall color, when you saw other seasonal transitions at autumn time, such as the fantastic mushrooms, um, the frogs when they first began to sing, uh, bird tracks in the wintertime told us about the migrations of animals. Um, I think that 
one of the great pleasures of doing this book with John and the other scientific collaborators of the Harvard Forest was this the pleasure of taking time to really notice the beauty of the natural world, how the skin on the floor of the muddy surface of that puddle, and to see the newts that would come out any time it became damp or cool, and you had to really watch your step. These little tiny juvenile salamanders were everywhere, and I loved their sort of noble Jurassic bearing. To actually observe the formation of raindrops as they would cascade down the surface of the bark of my tree, see how the lens of water would magnify the surface of the bark and the lichen to really um, notice the animals around me, to actually see those same frogs that I had heard sing in the spring grow up in the summer into adults, to really enjoy that first push of the ferns through the soil, through the leaf litter, the deep duff of the forest floor in the spring, and see their beautiful circinate vernation as they would gradually stand up and unfurl their fronds, to observe in detail through a journal that I kept with John of the forest and its seasonal changes, collect the native plants, press them, and finally, to climb. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm a member of the uh, ISA in New England, and the reason for that is because I took a series of uh, tree climbing workshops. It, I figured out that if I was actually going to get to know my tree, I was going to need to climb it. It wouldn't be enough to just walk around underneath it. I needed to actually get up in it. And what you're seeing here is um, my first lesson with Melissa Labangi. She's the tree warden for Peter Sand, a championship climber. And there she is testing my harness on my first lesson. And I look a little skeptical, right? <laughs> and I won't lie to you, I was more than a little bit skeptical, but I thought, what the hell? I'm, you know, 58 years old, I got health insurance, let's do it. <laughs> so uh, we did. And she got me up in my tree on the very first climb. And um, I can't tell you how important and how transformational it was to feel the tree under my feet, to not just be looking up at it from the ground, to be in its world. And uh, ever the reporter, of course, I took up my notebooks and did quite a lot of work uh, just being up in the tree, to, to feel its weight under me, to understand that a tree moves not just up and down, but side to side in the wind, to suddenly see how the tree canopy actually extends one branch just to the edge of the one next to it, that beautiful expression, canopy shyness. I love that, of how the branches will come so close but not quite touch between the trees, to really begin to understand the incredible connection of the tree canopy and its roots to the communities of, of fungi underneath the ground in the soil, the connection between the species of trees underground, the connection with a vast suite of lives of animals above ground. It, it was a thrilling thing to get to know a tree intimately and deeply and to understand that one of the reasons trees move us so is because they are these consummate diplomats negotiating complex relationships between insects and fungi and animals. After all, oak trees would not exist without the dispersal mechanism of blue jays and squirrels. And they, they command a vast array of resources. They are place makers. They are definers and makers of space. Unlike us, they can live in the same spot for hundreds of years, not depleting them, but making them richer, sustaining them. There's a lot we can learn from a tree. And I also um, loved just getting swept away by the sheer beauty of an individual tree, getting to know its life through the seasons, through the different hours of the day. I went walking in that forest in everything, from sandals to bare feet, to muck boots, to snow boots, to snowshoes. I was out there in spring, summer, winter, fall, day and night. And I want to read to you just a little bit about uh, what that made me think about sometimes when I would go out to visit my tree. More than a century stood here in the big oak. Through two world wars, farms gone to forest, a carbon and digital age began and still surging and the oak just grew steadily on, not unchanged, but persisting to each new day. 
I thought of it, shut down now for the night, a solar-powered miracle at rest during the reign of the moon. Could I sense the big oak and the lives all around, breathing just like me? What if the respiration of trees was visible, drifting into the night sky in a soft golden cloud? Perhaps then, the interconnectedness of our lives, easy to forget, would be more visible, our shared living breath and connection to this earth more apparent. I had never realized that trees have daily schedules, as surely as we do, with activities particular to the hour, and resting cycles that correspond to day and night. Graphed on paper, a day in the life of a tree looks like a bell-shaped curve, from a quiescent dawn to its height of activity at noon, winding down to its repose at sunset. I lay under the tree to look up into its crown, the leaves shut tight for the night, like a house waiting for morning. And so getting to know one tree well was a way to think about its daily cycles, to understand its incredible activities, all the things that it was up to. But it was also a window into a wider world of how our planet is changing. Not just the forests immediately around us, but indeed our planet. And to understand that the very seasons themselves are changing because of our alteration of the atmosphere. This shouldn't come as a surprise. The Earth is not just a collection of places. It's a, it's a dynamic interaction of systems. And we have changed those systems and set in place feedback loops that we can't control that are now making changes of their own. I think one of the things that surprised me was the research at the forest that showed ways in which we could actually see these changes even up close. For instance, my tree is growing faster than at any time in the last 25 years. They know this from looking at the rate of carbon exchange between the tree and the atmosphere and other measurements. That tree is bench pressing carbon like a teenager. That was a surprise to the scientists of the Harvard Forest. They thought trees, once they became about 100 years old, started to slow down. That's not true. The big ones are doing some of the hardest work. And we could really see how the rate of growth in that big oak had accelerated, changed over the course of its lifetime. Not only that, but they could see that the stomata in the leaves were beginning to behave differently because there is so much CO2 in the atmosphere now, why would a tree lose more moisture than it has to? Why would it open more stomata more widely than it has to? Trees are smarter than that. And sure enough, what they found was that even as the tree was increasing in its growth rate, its water use was decreasing. Why? The reason for that is because the stomata are opening less. Trees are smart. They don't want to risk water loss if they don't have to. And so the tree is actually growing more efficiently. It's growing faster, using less water to do so. Of course, that has implications for forest ecology. It changes everything from stream flow to humidity levels. So that's an important change in the physiology of the tree that affects the physiology of the forest. And it gets even more interesting. The actual timing of the seasons has changed. And in a very big way, because scientists had assumed that if spring continued to come earlier, that would mean that actually you have these incredibly longer and longer growing seasons, and that because you have longer growing seasons, the trees would just continue to continue to continue to accrete carbon. And you could count on them to continue to lower atmospheric levels of CO2, because the growing seasons would be so much longer. Actually, that's not right. Some of these early climate models have turned out to vastly overestimate the amount of carbon that trees would put on, even though they're growing faster, even growing more efficiently like my tree is. But you know what else has happened? Growing seasons are now so long, they are supersized. They last longer than the trees. The leaves on the trees are beat up, worn out, done for the year. Even though the weather remains fine, even as late as practically Thanksgiving now in these New England woods, the trees are senescing. They've just like called it. <laughs> They're done. They've done their work for the year. They could theoretically keep going, but they don't. They're senescing weeks earlier than the climate would seem to be allowing. Why is that? 
It's because the seasons now last longer than the leaves. The seasons are at a different time and created by us than the living world. It's actually a mismatch that is set in. That was surprising to me and a little bit alarming, to actually feel the hands of human influence on the length of the seasons in a mismatch that's beginning to extend into the lives of these trees and the forests in which they live. Talk to gardeners. Think yourselves about what you can grow now that you couldn't grow before in this climate. Think about how much later fall is actually coming and think about what you've seen in the forests around you and how they're reacting. We're seeing big changes in the woods. And I think that um, this finding that um, the seasons are now lasting longer than the leaves was one of the most surprising to me and also to some of the scientists I was working with. I want to talk about, um, however, the joy that also came to me in doing this book. Here I am writing one of the last chapters while sitting up in a hammock in my tree. This was one of the best days of my life, I gotta say. We packed a picnic. This was my final climb of the year. Um, the tree was finally in full leaf. It was the climb that I did that I would say actually transformed me into a climber. Not a terrified student anymore, but now someone who actually felt sure, strong, um, and mostly overjoyed as I scrambled up into the top. And uh, my instructors brought the hammock. I packed a big pick and a picnic of fried chicken, dark chocolate. It was a really fun day. We just stayed up there in the tree and I worked on the book. But mostly what I did was look around and feel the grace, the beauty, the miracle of this tree. It's about 85 feet tall, so it's not a big one like we have out here. Its canopy spread is about 65 feet, but it was a beautiful forest-grown oak at the height of its glory. And to feel the movement of it up there, to see how the light is so different from within a tree rather than just down there on the ground, you know, I have to say that that for me was a transformational experience. It was one not only of joy, but of a kind of deep inner peace, a feeling that, you know, people in trees, we go way back. Trees are some of our oldest traveling companions. They are both a source of inspiration and joy to us. And, you know, I just have to think that if we're smart enough to create the problem that we have with climate change through all of our industry, all of our inventions, we're smart enough to figure out a way out of this. I truly believe that. I'm an optimist at heart. Um, I'm grateful for that. But I also just look at the ingenuity of nature, and I know that we are part of nature. And I believe that if we work at this, and we begin to take this as seriously as we should, we can figure a way out of this. After all, trees can provide an example to us. Look at how they work. Do they stand alone, isolated, in a surely competitive stance with one another? No, they work with the other species, with the others in the forest in which they stand. And for that, they are much stronger, more adaptive, more resilient, more successful. Forests are our instructors, and every single tree matters, and we're gonna need every tree we can possibly keep in the future. I want to read to you just a little bit about uh, what it was like to be up in the tree on that final climb that day and some of what it made me think about. How captivating to see a tree from within. The light was ever-changing, the sun a luminous pageant of green and gold as the big oak's branches parted in the wind, letting the sun spill in, then swung back, offering light shade. Not the deep shade of the forest floor, but lacy, ever-changing with each toss of the wind. Everywhere there was movement. A black and yellow swallowtail butterfly cruised through the treetops just past my shoulder. The chickadees called sweetly alert to our presence. The leaves stirred in every direction as the wind blew and the tree moved with it up, down, and sideways all at once. The hammock rode the tree in the wind, its rocking embrace, amniotic and primal. I felt both at home and distinctly a visitor. I thought, what familiar and alien things trees are all at once. They remain wild, essentially other, a kingdom apart. We need them, but they do not need us. Yet, watching the oak from up here, for the first time, I felt I understood clues for our own persistence. I noticed the oak's genius in abiding with others, 
species above and below ground in a diverse, interconnected nation of lives. From the deer and the bear and the squirrel and the blue jay to the vast, spreading, nourishing mycorrhizal networks amid its roots, it seemed, I thought, rocking in the oak's embrace, that our task now is to live on this earth at least as successfully as this tree. It felt like a lesson, a personal reckoning, an ethical awakening from a human-centered or anthropocentric view to simply grasp the reality of where we truly stand on this earth. We're not separate from nature. We are of it and in it, and we need an ethical framework to match. We need a tree culture, a nourishing mutualism that embeds us in creation, working with one another in collaboration with nature to sustain us in our common home. From such a perspective, solutions can emerge. Without it, they likely will not. I do not mean that solutions lie only in individual action or conscience, but for governments and nations to do what they must, people everywhere must first conceive and insist on its necessity. So with that, Thank you for listening. Thank you for your work. Know that in the time of Thoreau, New England was virtually deforested. Know that today, not that much later, New England is home to the largest reforestation miracle anywhere in North America. With the return of the trees have come the animals, the bear, the deer, the moose, the so-called nobler animals that Thoreau had lamented were gone because of the deforestation of his age. Know that in trees, in forests, there's future and there's hope. Thank you. We, we have a few minutes for questions for Linda. Um, Open season. <laughs> yes, in the front. So out of that presentation, there was so uh, maybe at least eight pictures of people drilling trees. <laughs> I, I'm, I was waiting for you to say that the, the inspection, the analysis, the, even the climbing was low impact designed to minimize our effects of intrusion. So the question was, what about the impact of all that drilling in the trees? <laughs> the observation that, um, rather being a completely non-invasive observation, that we did do some invading of the tree, it's a, it's a good point, and I myself felt a little squeamish about that. I was new to tree coring and had never seen it done before. And the first time um, Dave took a, you know, took a turn with the, with the tree core into my oak, I actually kind of felt it a little physically, like, yeah, does this hurt? <laughs> so, these are micro cores. Um, they're teeny. They're so tiny they would actually fit inside a drinking straw, and you know they're taken to a depth of about that much. And you can core an adult healthy tree no more than twice a year. You shouldn't core a tree more often than that. But trees, including my tree, manage it. It's all right. I mean, I wasn't crazy about it. I had some of the same qualms you did, but it also tells us things that we can't know any other way. I mean, one of the wonderful things about dendrology, tree coring, is that unlike so many other sciences that we use, the error bar, if interpreted correctly, is zero. It's a physical record. It's the geology of biology. It is the place where the deep time of the tree in the forest can be read. You know, in a tree core, we can see what were the good years, what were the bad years. You know, you look at that narrow band in the, in the core and you think, eh, oh, something happened. Was it an insect attack? Was it a forest fire? That's when you can go and look in the human records, newspaper reports, farmers' journals, whatever you've got to work with, and understand what you're seeing in the tree core. But the tree doesn't lie. It tells you if it's been galloping along in its growth, like my tree, you should see those big wide bands, where you can see when something happened, and then you can figure out what that something was. They're fantastic recorders of climate change and fire regime, and they are used more and more as we try to interpret the changing landscapes around us. Yes, way in the back. What's your earliest tree memory? Oh, I love the question. What's my earliest tree memory? 
You know, I have a very specific answer to that. There was, at the house where I grew up in, a white cedar, a species you don't hear about too often, but it's a beautiful tree. Not that big, uh, probably about mm, 80 feet tall. And that tree was my friend. I would lean against that tree when I came home from school and read, or better yet, I climbed it. <laughs> my first sense of sovereignty as an individual person happened in that tree, escaping my brothers, my parents, everybody, climbing up all the way to the top of that tree and just staying up there in my little treetop, girl nation of one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so, you know, that's my earliest tree memory, is my, my day in, day out uh, love with that particular tree. There are also, as I mentioned, were seven acres of woods where I was lucky enough to grow up. And there were certain individual trees there that I watched very closely. There was a beech in particular. You know, beeches have that beautiful architecture. They're really stately, graceful trees. And that one in particular, I, I bonded with. I watched that tree year by year as I grew up. I was lucky. We moved to that house when I was five, and I didn't leave it till I went away to college. So I really did see that forest, you know, through every season, every day after school, that's where I went. So there were certain trees I followed as individuals, including that beach. And while I was away at the Harvard Forest, uh, my husband convinced me, incredibly, to actually go back to that forest for the first time since my parents had sold it in 1992. I never went back because I was terrified something might have happened to the forests. And I snuck, yes, snuck onto the property. The people were not home, the new owners, we parked down the street. I wasn't caring about the house, which by the way looked the same. I wanted to see the forest. And so we went scampering right up into the woods Here's the miracle, in a gift too kind for this world, it was completely intact. Every tree, all still there. My beach, I held it close. <laughs> so, you know, trees do that for us. They bind us to landscapes, they hold memory, they hold love. And I think that for all of us uh, who care about trees, that's not something to suppress or say is too woo-woo or unscientific. It's actually the gas that is the fuel that helps us do the work we need to do to speak for the living world and take care of it, make the tough decisions, say the tough things when they need to be said. <laughs> yes, I think I saw a hand in the blue shirt. Yes, I hope you brought a couple of cases of books. I did bring books. Um, your conference organizers did a fantastic job with everything from what I can tell, but they also managed to get a passel of books and I'll be downstairs in the, um, you know, where all the great swag and treats are. I'll be down there with books and glad to sign. What species is it all? Say it again, please. Oh, it's a red oak, Quercus rubra. You know, good old red oak. Just an absolutely utilitarian tree. It's interesting, in Massachusetts, um, they have a lovely name for it. They call it the tuition tree. Because, you know, when a family in some hill town in Massachusetts needed some cash, the Red Oak was the one. You know, if you needed to pay the tax man or send somebody to college, Red Oak, that's your ticket. Chestnut was the incredible species on, with which so many of the beautiful old houses and barns are framed in New England. But of course we lost it to the chestnut blight. It was Red Oak that surged into those places. And today, insect, the woolly adelgid, is beginning to take out hemlock in New England. This is a great tragedy and something people are enduring with a great amount of grief. It's predicted that within 20 years, virtually all of the native eastern hemlock of New England will be gone. Those places, some of them will still be forests, but they will not be the same because hemlock provides that beautiful green in a New England wood and it provides the shelter for deer from deep snow and snacking for porcupines. You know, they're a very essential species. And, you know, we don't necessarily hem celebrate hemlock so much up here in the Pacific Northwest. It was even considered a trash tree, best for pulp by many for many years. But back east, they have a poetic standing. Um, so red oak, though, gives us hope because its surge into the space that was held by chestnut is exactly what's now happening with um, black birch, Betula nigra, in the New England woods. They're moving in where the hemlock stood. So these will be forests. They'll be different forests. You know, this lecture is about climate change and change in the woods. And we all know that nature never stands still, and the forest is never unchanging. 
that's the way it is. Um, so change, I'm not saying change is bad, but change that's caused by human action, change that's coming faster than native species and the animals that they support can adapt to, that's something to pay attention to because you know what? There's no like little secret handshake private deal for humans. We're part of this thing. And if it starts to unravel, we're going with it. So if we want to stay on this beautiful planet to which we are so perfectly suited, it is about recognizing that we are part of nature, we are embedded in nature, and as it goes, so do we. Life on Earth is the most powerful force. It will endure way past us if necessary. This place will reset to rocket ice. It's happened before. And you know, what do we want? Do we want some future culture? Hundreds, hundreds of millions of years from now to look into some layer, some strata, and say, huh, what were they? <laughs> they really liked plastic. <laughs> you know, we've been around a very short time on this beautiful planet, and I do believe that we have the capacity and the heart to figure out how to stay here a lot longer in the company of beautiful trees. Thank you. to stand up here and come up with better uh, or additional words to build off of what Linda's provided this morning. And, uh, Linda, I, we really appreciate you and, and writers like yourself who choose to find new and exciting ways to communicate trees. Um, you know, a lot of us, we work with them, but we don't necessarily know how to explain the, the passion that we have for them. And I think you helped find us that. In, in particular today, I, I heard you describe trees as diplomats. And I know I've often described trees as ambassadors, but bringing that in has been really, really cool. So, um, oh, come on. I just wanted to say I am a working full-time reporter at the Seattle Times and I want your story ideas. I'm super easy to find. Lmakes at seattletimes.com. Call me. Thank you. So we're, we're going to have a 30-minute break.